Well, hello, everybody. Praise God. I hope you're doing well. Today is the big election day in America. Oh, election day. Dummies. You're electing the devil. You don't have a choice in election. It's selection. They choose their own and they give you the fake reality that you have a big part in it. And they give you a little sticker. Look here, I voted today. And they laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. Because your candidate may be selected or they may not be selected, but they surely won't be elected. Okay? It doesn't work that way. Now, it may, down there at the grassroots level, you know, your county, your city mayor, that thing, it may happen at that level. But once it gets up there to the governor and your state senate and Congress, nope, selected. Okay? And we got to know that. I hope you're doing well. Praise God. Here we are. The rapture window opens tomorrow. We're excited about all that. We're going to go see Jesus, guys. We're going to go see our Lord. We're going to go see our Savior. We're going to go see our friend. I hope he's your friend. He, he's really wanted to, to be your friend and you to be his. That's why he created us. And you look over there and you see Adam was his friend walking with him. And Enoch was his friend walking with him. And Noah was his friend walking with him. Every time he was beaten with that hammer, he was there with God thinking about the promises of God and what God told him to do. And he was there obeying the Lord and walking with the Lord. Abraham, he was his friend and he walked with him. Isaac, Jacob, they walked with the Lord. Had to wrestle the Lord. The Lord had to cripple him to get his attention, to get him to slow down, to get him to focus, to get him from being a supplanter and a manipulator to being a prince with God, Israel, from Jacob to Israel, a prince with God. Praise God. See, God's been doing that with us all of our lives, and that's what Feast of Tabernacles is all about. Okay? You know, Sean has put up a couple new codes since last night. I want to look at those real quick, man. Praise the Lord. Okay, and they're both about the Shroud of Turin. Now, why is he popping these out here, you know? Because they're going to be huge in the tribulation. You all know that Sean is coming back in the tribulation, right? He's one of the witnesses, one of the lampstands. He's the guy, he's the Bible writer of God's Bible codes, God's word in his dialect. And we'll all be raptured together. I don't know exact date of that, but it'll be here during... The Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. And it will finish. It'll complete the Pentecost harvest. Because Pentecost is included in Sukkot. It's all the summer harvests. The summer harvest ends with Sukkot. There's no such thing as spring feast and fall feast. That is a name that is given according to the Gregorian calendar. All seven feasts fall within, or they land, all seven feasts land within the summer fruits, the spring and summer Pentecost gathering, all seven of them. There's no spring and there's no fall. They're all spring, summer, okay? Studying it deeper and, you know, and that's one thing about Sukkot. One thing about Sukkot, a Feast of Tabernacles, is you must keep learning. You must keep being corrected by the Torah, by the Word. And it must straighten you out. And you must always guide your ship, your life, with the Word of God. And when you see the lighthouse over here and, and your ship has been going over here, you get yourself in line with the lighthouse, with the Word of God. Jesus is the light. And these Bible codes about the Shroud of Turin, dude... They're going to be, I mean, incredibly huge. And so our part is what? To pray. Lord, take these. Because there's going to be a certain one-third who survives to the end. And we're praying for that one-third. We're praying for those that get killed. There may be some who still go to heaven that get killed, who don't live to the end. Because they heard the preaching of the word. They saw the Shroud of Turin. They heard the preaching of the light of the gospel. And they believed in the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ because of faithful witnesses. Sean and the other guy and the 144,000, they will have believed their report. 
Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Those who will believe. Amen. All right. Let's look at that first one. This is from nine hours ago. It says, the hatred of a body, which is the shroud of Jesus. Okay. And we'll read Sean's commentary here. It says, the brilliant radiance of the glory of the Lord was permanently imprinted on the uppermost uh, fibrils of the shroud, similar to a flash of light, as intense as a nuclear explosion. Okay, when Jesus rose from the dead, the power of God, the power of life, the power of resurrection, boom, the light that was emitted is equal to that of a nuclear explosion to cause what it caused in that fiber, the shroud that we refer to as the Shroud of Turin because it's located in Turin, Italy right now. Okay. You could say that this flash of light happened in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Let's say that. Before the shroud moved to Turin, it was burned in a fire. In 1502, the House of Savoy placed the shroud in St. Chapelle in a town, which is now part of France. In 1532, a fire broke out in, in the chapel. It melted part of the silver in the container protecting the shroud, and this silver fell onto part of the shroud burning through it. The burn marks and the water stains from where the fire was extinguished are still visible today. And that's what we see. We see the burn marks and the stain marks. John 15, 18 to 19. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me. This is Jesus talking. If the world hates you, you got to know that it hated me before it hated you. Amen? If you were of this world, the world, they love their own. But because you are not of this world, but you have chosen, uh, I have, God says, Jesus, I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. I really hope the world hates you terribly. I hope. And, and what it is, is there's, there's nothing provable in a court of law why they should hate you. They just hate you because they hate Jesus. If they hate me, they're going to hate you. Why? Because Jesus is the light shining in us and they're going to hate you because of him. And too many Christians are sociably accepted, man. People just love fleshly Christians. They cuss right along with them. They watch the same movies with them. They go to the same rock concerts with them, rap concerts, country music concerts. They hang out with them, drink some beers, good old boys. Boom. You know? And I'm thinking, we're, we're about to be raptured. We got the six seals coming up. Total devastation. Death among millions, if not a billion. Okay? This is all coming up. And we got Hank over here singing, a country boy can't survive. And them boys are chewing on their hay straw. And they got that dip in their mouth. They got a beer in their hand. And they just think they're going to survive because I'm a country boy. I can I can skin a buck deer. I can skin a bear. I can run a trot, trot line. And this country boy can survive. You won't survive those four horses. You won't survive the earth tilt. You're a dead man. What you need to do is get saved. You need to place your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and realize, you know what? I'm a country boy, and what I see in Scripture and what I hear from these preachers, I'm not going to be able to survive this, and I don't even want to be here for this. Lord God, will you please save me? I don't care nothing about no trot line, and I don't care nothing about skinning no buck, okay? I want to be saved. Will you get me out of here, Lord, and take me along with the rest of the body of Christ? He's about to snatch us out of here during this Feast of Tabernacles. We got our calendar right. It is now... Boom, straight on. And I hope they hate you. Not because you're a jerk and not because you're foolish and not because you're hateful. The conversation today, I heard some folks over talking about a guy at work who's just so hateful every day. Nobody can stand to be around him. He's a manager. Imagine that. Nobody can stand to be around the guy. Everybody tries to just do their best to stay away from him. And they hate him for the wrong cause. They hate him because he's hateful. But if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to hate you because you're filled with love. You're filled with the light of the gospel. You're filled with truth. You're filled with the same uh, overcoming resurrection power that Jesus Christ had. And that Holy Spirit is in us and they hate us because of him. Amen. And let's look at the code. This is today's code that came up about nine hours or so ago. It's the hatred of a body, which is the shroud of Jesus. And here it goes. It says the translation 
the hatred of a body, which is the shroud of Jesus, the radiance of his glory and the express image of his being. Jesus, which is Yeshua, it says here, because we're reading in the Hebrew text, right? Uh, let's see here. Uh, it's actually the Aramaic text. This is the New Testament. This is a New Testament code. And so it's Yeshua. This is a sign for the scientific one. It will be burned in the fire. Guys, imagine being left behind in the tribulation. And you got a couple guys walking up to you with sackcloth on. And they got this thing draped over their arms. And they're showing it to you. Here's the Shroud of Tur Turin. You, you heard about it before. Blah, blah, blah. Now here it is in the Bible. This was God saying it. This was always in the Bible. And these Jews are going to appreciate it. Uh, many of the Gentiles will appreciate it. The story being told. Here's scientific documentation. These people want science proof. You know, we saw the x-rays. And I think that's in the, in the next one as well. Uh, the whole shroud is an x-ray and then it's an x-ray of x-rays. And we'll look at that. Uh, I also, man, you know, both Lindy and George have some great commentary in here. And I want to include that in tonight's video. Okay. Uh, Lindy, another amazing code, and she's absolutely right. They're all amazing codes, aren't they? The fact that there are multiple codes on this shroud should make us all sit up and pay attention. God has mentioned it more than once, so we'll, uh, so we'll understand just how important the powerful and very moment of the resurrection was, okay? It was a boom in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This explosion came through like a nuclear blast, bam, and it gave us the imprint of Jesus Christ in 3D on a cloth to prove scientifically that Jesus rose from the dead and no man can mimic or duplicate this thing. Lindy goes on to say, there is no other piece of evidence like it in the entire world, none. It has never been able to be replicated because God did it. God himself did this. Jesus' moment of transformation and resurrection was so powerful that it created this perfect image on the cloth, just as Sean says above. Similar to the flash of intense light at a nuclear explosion. Our God is amazing. Did he have to leave this evidence for us? No. Did he have to? Because God loves faith. He doesn't need evidence. We got an empty tomb. But he didn't have to do it, but he did it. Um, he encoded it indeed. Did he, uh, let's see. He did it just as he does everything else through his great love for us so we could have all the proof that we ever need. And you and I will be in heaven and this thing will be shown all over the place with these Bible codes to back them up. And the Bible codes will be explained and the people will see it. The Jews will see it and they will be in tears. They'll be looking into the face of their savior that they killed, their own brother. And many of them will come to believe because of this evidence here. You and I will be in heaven. It's interesting that we're going to go to heaven. And when we get there, it'll, it'll be during Sukkah time. Everybody's going to have these little huts made up. You know, we're, I, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, he pre prefaced all that with, in my father's house are many mansions. And then I go to prepare a place for you. And when we get to heaven, we're going to be in little booths, three-sided booths. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. And it's going to remind us of some important, important details of our lives that we should be focused on and thankful for. Uh, Lindy continues. She says, another... Um, Amazing example of God's love in his codes is that the ELS, that's the equidistant letter sequence, in God's writing, he doesn't uh, go single skip letters like we do. The, cat, bit, the, dog. Okay? That's the way we read our English. God skips. He's, he has many spaces and it depends, but they're always exact, equidistant letter sequences, always to make it a real code. Okay, so they've got so many triangulations of proof of God's love, man. We've got his plain text, and they, they already embrace the plain text, the Jews. Not the secular ones, not the rebellious ones, but they'll come to, they'll come to revival. They'll believe in grandmama's book, just like many Christians do here now, okay? I talked to a kid today who's going through a, a dry out program and, and stop your addiction. It's a great program. And uh, I asked him. He said, I'm from the Tupelo, Mississippi area. I said, 
uh, so were you like raised in church? He goes, I was raised in church. I went to church, but I never knew Jesus till just recently. And I said, there's a big difference in that, isn't there? And so these Jews are the same way. Many of them don't go to synagogue. Many of them don't attend teachings. Many of them don't, they're secular Jews or they're rebellious Jews. But when the big catastrophes happen, the first, second, third, fourth, sixth sealed judgments and the seventh sealed judgments with all these fireballs coming down and everything, they're going to be listening to these two guys in sackcloth saying, you all need to run for the hills. Get yourself out of this particular town, What whatever God leads these guys to preach. Get yourself out of here and get to high ground if you want to continue living. Or get yourself to low ground because we got some more of these fireballs coming in. And these people will learn to listen to the direction of the preachers, the, the men of God, who've come to direct them to be shepherds against these wicked idol shepherds. Barack Obama's the idol shepherd. And then you got his 10 kings, which are idol shepherds. They're, they're, they're not good shepherds in shepherding their nations and their people. But these two people will be directing people and they'll believe the Bible codes. They'll see the evidence of the shroud and they got the ELS. And that's what Lindy's talking about right here. It's just one more proof of his wonderful love. All these numbers, again, they add up to the most perfect definitions of the code. And so when you got your ELS and, and it's divisible, you know, it's, uh, 29,458 and for every that exact number they skip and God is skipping those numbers all the way through his New Testament his Aramaic text and he's giving us his word about the shroud and boom these people are going to be freaked out we should be freaked out on this side I know people who make fun of it my dearest friends my dearest friends for the past 10 years decided they don't like the Bible code and they just are not cool with it and they make fun of it and they snicker at it. I had to block them. I block them from my Facebook so I won't res be responsible for them digging their hole deeper in their snickerville, in their making fun, in their laughter and in their scoffing. These people know about those verses that in the in end of days, men will be scoffers. They have no idea that they are those men. They have no idea that they are the scoffers. They, they claim they're fine with the 66 books, but they don't like this Bible code. And Lindy's explaining to us how perfect this Bible code is. And when you take that skip of, of, of all those letters in red going straight up and down that say the hatred of a body, which is the shroud of Jesus, those letters going up, they're at a skip of 29,458. 29,458, 29,458 until they say this entire sentence. That is God at work. That's something that only God can do. The Jesuits and the Catholic Church, people always say, oh, the, the Bible is something that the, the Catholic Church, the Vatican came up with to direct traffic and make people think and make people fearful and they're afraid. And it's like, no, uh, the Bible makes you feel joyful if you'll read it and you'll see that this Code within it is absolutely a God thing. That makes the plain text a God thing. Every word of God is pure. Every yod, every tittle, every letter of the Hebrew alphabet is perfectly placed. That's why God said, and don't you dare move them. Do not move the ancient landmarks. You leave the Bible the way I wrote it. And we found all these original texts. We found these texts in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, in the caves, Qumran Caves. And they're all matching this, the same old, old text because God has his special text within the text he refers to as the Bible code. Oh, the Bible codes. I've had pastors and preachers laugh at that phrase. The Bible codes. Oh, the codes. You idiot. We call it that because we found that in the codes. That's what God calls it. God calls it my codes. God calls it Sean's codes. The book of Sean Mitchell, the little book. God calls it these things and we call it as he calls it. Is, it. is that what you do in your faith? Whatever God says, you go with it. Amen? All right. So back to Lindy's number. So, so let's look at this number. This 29,000 skip 400 and, uh, yeah, 458. So 2 plus 9, that's 11. Plus 4 is 15. Plus 5 is 20. Plus 8 is 28. So that's how she gets this number here. 28. And what does 28 mean in biblical numbers? Christ in you, the holy temple. So God gives us codes within the codes and he gives us these numerical codes within the codes. 
how the skip works, how the skip talks, what God is saying in the skip. It, it, guys, and, and when we get to heaven, we're going to see that it, there's information inside the information inside the information. It goes deeper than what we know. Will you just believe the plain text and will you believe the coded text? Please. You'll love it when you look into the author's eyeballs at the judgment seat of Christ. I believed every word, Lord. Even the words I didn't understand, I believed them. I, I believed them. I just believed, I believed, I believed. That needs to be our heart as children. Unless you believe like a child, you're believing wrong. Okay, so that's where she gets this number 28. 28 is Christ in you, holy temple. 28 is also double 14s. What does she say about 14s? It means righteousness and rapture. Because rapture is mentioned, harpazo is the Greek word. Harpazo is mentioned 14 times in the Bible. So when we think of harpazo, the rapture, it's 14. 14 is the number that goes with that. Uh, so 28 is double 14, righteousness and rapture. It means righteousness. It's also a multiple of seven. Seven means divine completeness and perfection. We see seven, seven days in the week. We see seven years in a Shemitah. We see seven prongs on the menorah. That's God's completed number. Perfect. Okay. Seven means divine completeness and perfection. It is God's number. This is also a multiple of the number four. Four, seven times four is 28. It's a multiple of four. Four means heavenly door open, personal or spiritual change. The fourth day of the creation. What, what's the fourth day of creation? When he created the sun, moon, and stars and gave us Nabu, Nabiru above our heads. Very soon, guys, people in Israel are going to be laying eyes on God's signatures, his signs. One of those is the Shroud of Turin. One, uh, two of those are the prophets in Jerusalem and wherever God leads them in sackcloth. They're in the Bible and they're going to see these two guys. They're going to lay eyes on it. It's not this faith thing that they have to just believe by not seeing. They're going to lay eyes on the two guys, the witnesses, the lampstands, the olive trees. They're going to lay eyes on the Shroud of Turin. They're going to lay eyes on Nibiru and his seven planets, the seven-headed dragon. They're going to lay eyes on that and it's spitting out all the wrath from its tail. They're going to see it. They're going to they're gonna have a front row seat and believe everything that the book of Revelation and the Bible prophets have said. And so four is the, the heavenly open door. That's the rapture door. We see that the judgment seat of Christ door. Four is Dalit. The, the Hebrew letter it, uh, is Dalit. It's the fourth letter. And it's, it's, it also represents a door. So that's what she's saying here. It's the fourth candle of the menorah, which is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ, and he's included us, the church. Pentecost. He's included us with him in that fourth light of the candle, guys. Do you understand how large and how beautiful and awesome this is? Nope. Not today's church. I pray you do. Few there be that really get this. Few there be that find it. And I pray that you're part of that bunch who's found it. So she goes on to say, she's talking about these numbers. She's talked about 28. She's talked about seven. She's talking about four right now. It's the fourth day of creation, the fourth candle of the menorah, which is the fullness of Pentecost season. And the fullness of Pentecost season, Pentecost started on Pentecost when the Holy Ghost came down, 3,000 souls were saved. Peter preached that great message. And what he preached was what we experienced early this morning, that blood moon. Joel preached it and Peter preached it. And he's like, at the very beginning of the Pentecost age, he preached about that blood moon. You better be looking for it. Just before the great and dreadful, terrible day of the Lord. Here we are at the end. We just witnessed it last night, this morning. It's here. Now the rapture is going to happen and then devastation will then follow immediately. When they say peace and safety, then cometh sudden destruction. So we're, what we're doing is looking at this code that Sean did nine, 10 hours ago, and we're looking at Lindy's commentary on it, which is phenomenal. Okay. Uh, all her commentary is phenomenal. She and George put it together. Jeff's got some great stuff in there and we love to see it. And of course, you always got to look at what Sean, his commentary before the translation, because the Lord's been working in his heart through a whole bunch of codes that we've never seen. So when he gives us a little commentary, you might want to go, bing! Get your little listening device out there and listen up with intent. Uh, the fourth candle of the menorah, which is the fullness of the Pentecost season and the church age. And it means to hear or to see a message. The number four. 
So the, the numbers in the Bible mean something, and God has included them in here with his skips, with the coded text, inside the plain text, and it's all right there, and the Jews are going to get it. I wish you Gentiles would. I wish the church would. You're supposed to have the Holy Spirit of God in you, and the church can't see anything. The church is the most blind bunch of folk ever. And Jesus said that would happen. And the reason the church is so blind, he said this, because you have not had a love for the love of the truth. You've had a love for your favorite things. Uh, you are, you've been drawn away of your own lust and enticed. And so you love the things of the world. And he told us, don't love the things of the world. You love what I love. You love my scriptures. You love the truth. People don't even know the truth. Christians don't even know the truth. You got to read the Bible to know the truth. Jesus is the truth. He's the word made flesh. And Christians don't even know the Bible. They can't even break down the Bible passages for you. The, the most, the, I mean, guys, the majority of the church today does not even know the Bible prophecies. And that's what we're living in the middle of right now. They think it's already passed because their stupid preachers told them that because their stupid preachers went to a seminary where the devil was in charge. And the witches made their way in there, and they had little changes along the way, pretending to be great stalwart men and women of God, teaching lies. And so people come out of there saying, oh, hey, the Old Testament has been fulfilled. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then just let's, you know, party Garth and let's do our thing. And the church has turned into Laodicea, neither hot nor cold, because they do not have a love for the love of the truth. And Jesus said this, since you don't have a love for the love of the truth. You know, you don't crave it. You don't desire it. You're hungry and thirsty like Job. Job said, I desire, Lord, your word more than my necessary food. The modern preacher doesn't even do that. The massive majority of the modern day preacher doesn't desire the word. And we're told, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And the church doesn't, uh, you know, desire the milk. They desire things. They desire the creation over the creator. And we're warned against that in Romans chapter 1. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise and godly, this bunch I told you at the beginning of tonight's Bible lesson, who has no idea how far they've slipped away. They have slipped away and they have no clue because they're blind, because they love the things of the world, and the things of the world has blinded their eyes. The Bible says the God of this world has blinded their eyes. Satan. Why? Because they joined him. When you don't love the truth, you don't love Jesus. And God said this, because you've not had a love for the love of the truth, I will turn you over to the deception, the lie. And that's where the modern day church is right now, because they don't hunger and thirst after Jesus. They hunger and thirst after everything else that Jesus created. Big no-no. All right, so we're looking at this Bible code that he did this morning. And then she goes on down, and another number is number 29. 29 means holy one, holy life, holy vow. Jesus, and only Jesus, praise God for his willing death for us on the cross so that by his innocent, perfect blood, we can be saved through faith in it. And praise God, we also have the promise of our resurrection because of his resurrection, amen. And that's what we're looking at is the uh, the Shroud of Turin being authentic, God authenticating it. We saw that in last night's code. We see it in this morning's code. And then um, we got Jeff's commentary. Let's look at Jeff says, there's so much to say about how the image got into the wrappings of, it's amazed the scientists who have no earthly explanation for the Shroud of Turin. Their explanation is simple. The pure radiance of the glory of God. That, that's, that's what we've come to. That's what God tells us. It's his radiance. His resurrection power <clears throat> exploded through that thing. He's the light of the world. And now we know, hmm, it's the equivalency of nuclear, of atomic light. It was a blast that nobody can duplicate or replicate without destroying the cloth. Okay? Oh, you could, you could duplicate the, the flash, a nuclear flash, but you're going to destroy that cloth. Jesus did it all when he rose from the dead without destroying it and put his Im, imprint on there. Okay? The glory of God emblazoned upon the cloth, both front and back, as Jesus' body flashed from earthly to God's glory and vanished from the tomb in heaven. There is no sun... 
Oh, well, in, in heaven, there's no sun needed uh, to be the light. Jesus himself is the light there. It, it's the pure radiance of God's glory that does this. And it's very substantiative and tangible, physical thing, capable of actually lighting up the entire dimensional plane that heaven resides in. Jesus is the light there. God is the light there. And that was that light that exploded through that cloth, giving us the imprint. Uh, great word, guys. Let's see what George has to say. Uh, he, he gave us a bunch of pictures on this one. Uh, of uh, you want, You'll want to look at this. You'll want to look at this Bible code, guys. Get over here. Uh, Vondo puts the link on YouTube. Okay? He puts the link on YouTube. He puts the link on my Facebook where you can find these Bible codes and go to looking for them. And then George puts up these pictures and he gives small explanations of the pictures on this particular one. Okay, let's go on to the next one. This is the last one. This was from about five hours ago. It says, his delight was an x-ray, okay? And we have studied the, sh the shroud in depth in the past. And so, and George has put some links here. Jeff has put links in here concerning the shroud that you'll want to study what has been done to them in Italy, scientifically, and from the Vatican's finest and coming up with the uh, authenticity of it all, right? Hey, guys, do you guys remember when that little widow gave her two mites she gave everything and, and jesus made note of it hey peter come here check this out all these rich guys that they gave just you know a little bit out of what they had but this woman gave out of her penury she gave everything she had those exact mites are the very ones we see emblazoned in the shroud of turin joseph of arimathea and nicodemus went down to the treasury and grabbed those mites and put them on jesus's eyes for the burying and we're going to see it. And we see flowers, uh, you know, herbs and spices. They wrapped him in 100 pounds of that stuff. And we see uh, spices on him that only came from the Jerusalem area. When they did all this testing, I, I encourage you to test it. And God is proving it, that it is his real thing. And it's going to be a show and tell during the tribulation for the Jews first and also to the Gentiles, whoever will believe and listen to the two prophets, the two olive branches. The two olive trees as they're preaching. All right. This one here. Let's see what Sean says about it. He says, is it just a coincidence that the shroud research tells us that the image of the shroud is photo-like, three-dimensional, holographic, and appears to show bone and detail structures in an x-ray-like fashion? So it's an x-ray of an x-ray. Okay? The way the, way the light in, uh, embossed on this cloth. It's the whole form of Jesus, but it's also blew through his skin to show that he's flesh and bone and took x-rays of his fingers and joints and other things. Okay? Okay? He was not just, ooh, spirit. And he, the, the Bible tells us that anybody who will not claim that Jesus came in the flesh is of the spirit of Antichrist. And the Shroud of Tyran pr proves that he is 100% human. And upon his... Raising from the dead, boom, we see that he is still flesh and bone. Praise God. And what, hey, you know what's so interesting about this time, about Sukkot, about the Feast of Tabernacles, is they read the book of Ecclesiastes. And what is Solomon really freaked out over? How in the world do bones grow in the womb of a mother? That really trips me out. And they read that right here at Sukkot, the time that we're in right now, starts tomorrow, the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, so Sean goes on and he says, man, this x-ray-like image was easy for God, right? Because he spoke everything into existence. He said, let there be light. In other words, he said, let there be me in a physical plane. God's a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And it was time to build a physical plane. And he said, first thing we're going to do is introduce myself to this physical plane. Let there be me. Let there be light. And there was light. And what did God do? He divided the light from darkness. And that's been his game plan ever since. And the church won't do that. The pastors won't do it. The pastors will not divide light from darkness. They dive straight into darkness and say, I praise God for this evil. Go back to our Sunday morning service. Okay? That's what they were doing in the book of Judges. They were thanking God for their gods. They were thanking God for their idols. They were thanking God for their temples. They were thanking God for their fault preachers. They were thanking Jehovah, guys. Oh, Lord, thank you for the, all this evil in my life. Uh, uh, oh, grace. 
Check that out. Uh, this x-ray-like image was so easy for God, just like our resurrection and rapture will be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Sean. I agree with that, too. The transfiguration of Jesus Christ explains the process of what happened here with the Shroud of Terror and at the resurrection as well. Check it out. We're going to read that. Uh, Matthew 17, 2 states, And he was transfigured before them, right, Peter, James, and John, and Elijah and Moses were there on the mount transfiguration and Jesus was transfigured he was glowing in the dark the glory of God was exploding out of him okay remember when he was on earth he he was only a man he was 100% God and 100% man but his role here was 100% man he never acted as God here whenever he did a miracle it was through the power of the father Whenever he did anything, when he was to be seen of men, it was God the Father getting the glory. And he said, what you've seen the Father do, you've seen me do. What you've seen me do, you're seeing the Father. So it was always the Father through nights of prayer. Jesus would pray, 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 pray. And the next day he'd go choose 12 disciples after the Father gave him wisdom. Okay, So he was here as a man, but up on that Mount of Transfiguration, which is a picture of the rapture, when the men go up and see the glorification of God. Okay? So, Matthew 17, 2, and he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Mark 9, 2 and 3 records the same transfiguration event. It says, and he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining exceedingly white as snow, and as no fuller on earth, soap, no fuller soap, could whiten them this white. This was a white beyond the human capacity of whitening clothes. Okay, no ancient Chinese secret could do this. As there was an, uh, it was white as snow as no fuller soap could whiten them. And then the Luke 9 passage, Luke 9 29, mentions the transfiguration like this. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance changed and was altered, and his raiment was white and glis glistening, glistering is the word here, glistering. All three of the above cited scriptures state that he was transfigured, which means that his countenance changed and was altered. The Greek translation for this is, boy, I can't say that word, guys, but the number is Greek number 3339, which literally, literally means to change in form. An example of this word, met metamorphosis, is really what it comes down to. Uh, let's see where I lost myself. Yeah. Uh, would be when a caterpillar physically changes into a butterfly. In other words, the physical body of Jesus Christ was radiantly transformed before them, changing into light, and his face shone like the sun. The Greek word for shine is lampo, like we turn on a lamp, right? Lampo, which is Greek words 2985 and 2989 and the ones in between. And the English word lamp is derived from this. What do lamps do? They illuminate and provide light. These scriptures mean that the face of Jesus Christ turned into a brilliant shining and gave forth light. Matthew states that his clothing became white as light. Mark tells us that his clothing became shining whiter than the whitest snow. Luke tells us that his raiment was white and glistering. The translation for shining and glistering is 4744. Greek and and why do we why do we say Greek here because we're looking at the Greek right let's see here boom yep John 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 exactly Joshua we're in, we're in Joshua here in this one in the Hebrew but but what we're referring to is this the shroud like an X-ray and we have the examples in the New Testament of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration from three different authors telling us the same story and how he is not only his face shown and was brilliant but so was his clothing and now we have him at the burial site in the tomb and the same thing happened there going from death unto life okay uh Th that word in the Greek is to dazzle, to be brilliant, to flash like lightning. The whiteness of his clothing was not just white. It was exceedingly white. By using these uh, translations above, Jesus Christ's transfiguration can be reworded as follows. 
and the physical form of his body was changed into the brilliant radiance before them. The appearance of his face turned to bright shining and gave forth light brighter than the sun. His clothing became brilliantly white, dazzling white, flashing like lightning around them. So we saw that six months prior. The transfiguration took place six months before the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection, okay? The transfiguration happened right now, guys. Right now, tomorrow is the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And this passage, these three passages that Sean just showed us begin with this line. The first two say, and after six days, Jesus took his disciples up. After six days of Sukkot, of the Feast of Tabernacles, he took them up. And then the third uh, passage says, and it was almost the eighth day. So what is that telling us? It was the seventh day when they went up. I want, we need to really note that, okay? Because that's very important. Because there's eight days. And that eighth day is not really part of Sukkot. It's its own holiday, but it's attached to the Feast of of tabernacles very important very, very important and we got to watch it we got to understand it where we are right now okay tomorrow begins day one and jesus says after six days on the seventh day they all went up and they saw jesus glorified and what's going to happen when we go up at the rapture we're all going to be glorified we're going to share in, in his glory and and the only people who are going to be raptured are the people who shared in his righteousness not their own righteousness, not their own deeds, not their own goodness. We had imputed righteousness in us because of our faith in his finished work, his death, burial, and resurrection, which included the Shroud of Turin. It was his burial cloth when he was dead and they buried him in it. And then when he rose from the dead, boom, it lit that third candle of the Feast of first fruits. When Jesus died was the first candle lit Passover. When Jesus was buried the next day, the same night, but their day begins at night after 6 p.m., he was cleaned up, clothed up, and he was uh, he was donned in this shroud and also the headpiece, and boom, that was the second candle, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because his body was is without leaven, and he was buried, and then the third candle was lit on the menorah. Jesus completing the death, burial, and resurrection on the Feast of First Fruits, and boom, that's where we get the Shroud of Turin, and this is going to be a most awesome show-and-tell piece for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, evidence that uh, uh, that he is God, that he is the very one who shone six months earlier on the Mount of Transfiguration. There was five witnesses who saw him, three human, and two who had been human, who are now witnesses in heaven who came down to join Jesus. Now, at that time, they were in a place in Sheol. They were in a place called Paradise or Abraham's bosom. Nobody was allowed in heaven at that time. But Jesus called these guys up from that area and said, listen here, in six months, we're going to bring everybody from the bosom of Abraham. We're going to bring them to heaven with me because I'm about to die. And we're told that that was the conversation they had on the Mount Transfiguration. He told them about his death, burial, and resurrection, how he should die. And he was giving them the rundown, the game plan. Here's what's going to happen, guys. You, Moses, represent the law. You, Elijah, represent the prophets. You guys represent the Torah, the Old Testament, the Tanakh. And here's what's going to happen. I'm informing you guys. And boom, what did those guys do? They probably went back down to Sheol and informed everybody for the next six months what was about to happen. You don't think they were having a party? Remember, this is the seventh day of tabernacles. And remember when Peter wakes up, he sees it and he begins to talk, hey, let's make some tabernacles. Let's make booths. Let's make some coats. Let's make one for you, Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying, but he knew that it was time for the Feast of Tabernacles. And he says, Jesus, how about this? And the father broke the silence and said, don't you dare equate my Jesus with Moses and Elijah. Okay. My Jesus is special. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Boom. And then what Peter, James, and John fell on their faces before the Lord in holy, holy reverence on the Feast of Tabernacles, the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And immediately Moses and Elijah were gone. Back down to the bosom of Abraham and said, y'all listen up. 
we got something we have got to tell you. And from the seventh day until the eighth day, they were sharing with them the important things about tabernacling. What did they say? Hey, guys. Hey, uh, all you Jewish believers who, who left Egypt and, and made it to the promised land, y'all make, make your way here. Make your way here, says Moses. Come on up here. Come on up here. And all those in Abraham's bosom in paradise made their way forward. I said, yep. I said, you remember while we was out there in the desert and God told us to build a tabernacle? And he tabernacled among us. That was a representation of Jesus Christ, of God himself coming here to this earth and being a tabernacle among us. What is a tabernacle? Not a permanent building. It's a tent. Jesus came here in a mortal body, not a permanent eternal one. That happened later after he was glorified in heaven. He told Mary, don't touch me. I've not yet been glorified. As soon as he went to heaven and poured his blood out on the mercy seat, he was glorified, accepted of the Father, and he went down to the lower parts and he released everybody from that area. And they all went to heaven for the first time because of the blood. The blood had been poured out on the mercy seat and God accepted it. For the next 2,000 years was the Feast of Pentecost, the church age. We have been living in that and we're about to come to the close of the church age. And we'll come to the the. the Pentecost candle was lit when the Holy Spirit came down and they had cloven tongues of fire above their heads. That's when the Pentecost flame was lit. It's been burning for 2,000 years. Okay, along with the other three, the death, burial, and resurrection. The death, burial, and resurrection makes Pentecost happen in everybody who will believe spirit. We all experience the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit indwelling us, just like they did on that first day when 3,000 souls were saved. And now we have been, uh, the church has been being planted, planted, planted. But when you go study the Old Testament, the Feast of Pentecost is a harvest festival. And it's about to be completed in harvest. Jesus will have fulfilled the church age, the time of Pentecost, with a harvest called the rapture. It's pre Trib, pre trib. Guys, if you don't think it's pre trib, you don't know the heart of God. You don't understand the mystery of the church. You don't know your apostle Paul. You don't know. He's going to save us ek, out of. He's going to save us out of the hour of temptation, the hour of trial. He's going to save us out of the tribulation. And we have Bible codes saying it, guys. We have Bible codes saying that the first seal is God's wrath. The second seal, I mean, come on, think about it. The Antichrist, he's the first one to release. You don't think that's God's wrath? God's saving us out of that. We are not going to put up with that idiot. It's for all the people who aren't part of the body of Christ. People who don't believe in the pre-trib or don't even meditate on it, don't understand the mystery church, don't understand the body of Christ, don't understand the bride of Christ. And I'm going to encourage you to understand it because God's next thing that he's about to do here within these next seven, eight days is to rapture his bride. He's going to rapture us and that fifth light will have been lighted. Feast of Tabernacles. What does that mean? We who were once mortal will now be going to heaven and will be tabernacling among God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God's going to let us in his presence. And every year up there, they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles by building little booths. The requirement, it had to have three sides on it and you had to, you the, the roof had to be palm branches. The ones from Palm Sunday six months earlier. Okay? They had dried out, they had become thatch and then now you use them and you've got to leave opening. It, it can't be a solid, it needs to be like a lattice. So when you're in your sukkah, when you're in your little tent, you can look up and see the stars and it will re remind you, all of us, that God took care of us we're going from Egypt all the way to Israel in the land of the 40 years of testing, of promise. And we could look up and see God's what? Sun, moon, and stars, his signals. Day four. Day four is powerful. The creation. Okay? And so that was the requirement. And the requirement was joy. You had to have joy. And the requirement was you had to grab four different uh, branches and fruits and everything and bind them together and use them for a shaking instrument. And that was kind of weird semen, but it showed that God was 
omnipresent. He was powerful. He was good. They would shake it east, west, north, and south, up and down. There's nowhere where God's not. He's omnipresent. And we praise him for being with us wherever we are and for his bringing us a tabernacle. And they had that big tabernacle out there among them in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay, then we see that same tabernacle being parked in Shiloh. Now, it had several different locations once they came to the land of promise, but it parked in Shiloh just before, and it remained there until Solomon built the temple, the solid structure. And it was always a reminder that God had tabernacled with us while we were sojourning. Our sojourn's about to come to an end, guys. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles is all about. A reminder how God protected us, took care of us in our sojourn here. And most Christians, I am telling you, most Christians are not thinking about being sojourners. They have set up temporary residence here. They love the, the, the thought of a rapture wrecks their day. I don't want to be raptured now. I got things I got to complete and do and want to take care of. I got bucket list. And they don't even know the heart of the Bible. They don't even know the heart of the author. They don't even know God. To, to be so rude like that and to be so unthankful and ungrateful like that, they don't know God. Our desire is to be with him and be with him right now. Even so, come Lord Jesus, because the bride and the spirit say that. The spirit's inside the bride and we together are saying, come Lord Jesus. And if you're not saying, come Lord Jesus, come now, he's, come on, man, something's wrong with you. You're definitely wrong in your theology, and I'm wondering if the Spirit of God is in you, because he is saying, come. The Spirit and the bride say, come, Lord Jesus. And so this time that we're in right now, the time Jesus was in when he was up on the mountain in those three passages being transfigured before everybody was, everybody believes that. Everybody who believes the Bible believes that. Now it's time to believe that in the shroud. He did the same thing six months later, coming back from the dead when his Light exploded through that shroud. And we continue reading it. So, uh, Sean, we're looking at the, uh, his delight was an x-ray table, okay, which was about 10 hours ago. And we just looked at the Greek words, uh, meaning lamp and shining and glistering is to dazzle, to be brilliant, to flash like lightning. The whiteness was so white, nothing, we can't even describe that on earth, okay? And his radiance was awesome. The appearance of his face turned to bright shining and gave forth light brighter than the sun. His clothing became brilliant white, dazzling white, flashing like lightning all around him. Now, let's look at the code, what the code actually says. And when you see that in the Bible codes, guys, Bondo always puts the link up here. And when you're looking at Bible codes, when you see the part that says translation, Sean usually says, code by Sean Mitchell, because God calls it the book of Sean Mitchell. Okay. Just like we have the book of Jeremiah, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Daniel. God calls those books after those guys' names. And he did the same right here, the book of Sean Mitchell. So we see the code of Sean Mitchell. And then we see the translation. That is the very word of God from heaven. And that's what he has encoded in the plain text for us. It's amazing. And this little square box you see, this lightly shaded gray box, we refer to as the table. That red term going up and down is, you know, uh, they're single stacked on top of each other, is the axis term. That axis term in this one happens to say, his delight was an x-ray. Bam! On a skip of, let me blow that up here. Let's see here. Blow that up. Blow that up on a skip of 722. <laughs> Small skip. I love it. 722. So every 722 letters within the text, God is giving us this coded message that says his delight was an x-ray. Let's look at the code. His delight was an x-ray. Jehovah, that's yod heh vav -Hey, equals 26. Amen. We love that the letters of our alphabet. Every time you see an English letter, you ought to rejoice God is present. These 26 letters, God is here. When you're reading a book, God is here. When you're singing a song at church, looking at the l l words on the wall or in the hymnal, God is here, baby. That ought to lead us to that 26, 26 letters of the alphabet. Jehovah is exalted. He burned the mark. It was he who burned the mark. The shroud. We're talking about the Shroud of Turin. 
He flashed forth light, the spirit of life, the heart of healing. It is hidden. The sun who rose up, the slide projector of Jehovah is easy. What? He was talking about slide projectors from eternity past coded in the word that was forever settled in heaven. And then he got it to his guys here on earth and said, don't you dare change one letter, Joshua. Don't change one letter, Joshua. Okay, this whole code is found in the book of Joshua. Joshua, you read it. Just, and what is Joshua? We talked about that last night. This is the same book that little Isaac Tramble's code is found in. The Salvation of Yah. The same name as Jesus. Joshua is the Old Testament name for the New Testament Jesus, Yeshua. And in this book, Joshua, you write what I tell you. And don't anybody mess with the, with the words because I've got an encoded message in there about the Shroud of Terror that's going to lead a whole bunch of Jews to the Lord in the tribulation. They're not going to be able to refute the facts. Here's the two witnesses. Here's the Shroud of Turin. Here's the evidence. Here's the story. Here's what they're preaching. The slide projector. <laughs> I love that line, man. The slide projector of Jehovah is easy. The source is my lamp. Jesus, my lamp speaks. Jesus is the lamp of the Father. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven too. You're a lamp. You're to let your lamp shine. How do we do that? When, when we let the word shine. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You are my light and my salvation. It is Jesus in us, the Holy Spirit in us. Jesus is the lamp of the Father and you and I are the lamp of Jesus and the Father through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let your light so shine, folks. Joshua 10, 26. Oh, 26. What? Joshua, which is the salvation of Yah, 10 is complete completeness. It's that seven plus three. We've got the Trinity and perfection. Okay. All these numbers, when you start to learn them in the Bible, the way the Bible presents them, they tell a story of their own. That's why you don't get tired reading the book of Second Chronicles, First Chronicles, and she did this, and they had 450 people in their family. This one had 567, and that one over there had 666. And you don't get tired of that. You say, these numbers are vital to God. These names are vital to God. They're forever permanently engraved in stone in the scriptures. And we're going to get to heaven and going to meet these folks. And it will have been incredibly awesome of you not to have rolled your eyes at them. Oh, Chronicles. Oh, takes so long to get through. I've had people tell me that about Jeremiah. Jeremiah takes so long to read. If you would read it in bigger chunks, Jeremiah will blow your mind what's present there. And I encourage you to read it just like that. 10 to 20 chapters a day. 10 to 20 chapters a day. 10 to 20 chapters a day. Nope. Give me that remote. I'm going to watch some television. I want television. Tur turn on the TV. You have to look Jesus in the face and these other people that you rolled your eyes at. Praise God for his mercy and his grace. And there's now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. But there's a judgment seat. What's that about? Time of rewards. Don't miss out on your rewards because you didn't love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Don't miss out. There's going to be a lot of folks, guys, who are saved at the rapture, and we get to the judgment seat of Christ, and they ain't going to have nothing, none of those five crowns. I encourage you not to be one of those. I encourage you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Throw your TV out. Throw your garbage out. Throw your favorite sports out. They're all idols. Everything I just mentioned, Satan has suddenly come in and gave us teams and mascots and all this stuff, and they are the idols. We cheer and scream and laud and holler out as loud as we can for that. And we don't for Jesus. And you look at your heart. Where is your heart's burn? Where do you, where, where's your fire of your soul, your focus? Your idols. That's the answer for most Christians. It's, it's on your idols. And I'm going to encourage you to cast down your idols. Go over to Kydron, throw them in that little branch, Bust them up, throw them in that branch, and walk on with Jesus. Okay? To the garden. Now, let's do some praying. Let's do some growing in the, in the Lord. All right. 
Joshua 10, 26, and afterward, Joshua smoked them and slew them and hanged them on five trees, and they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. All right, that was Jesus, right? Didn't Jesus hang on a tree? We're talking about the Shroud of Turin. Look at that beautiful table, man. That's awesome. So here we are, guys. We find ourselves tomorrow in the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is when Jesus was transfigured before his three disciples and before us by faith. We see it, right? We believe it, right? Six months later, he went down into the lower parts to preach to everybody in the lower parts. Jesus didn't go to hell to fry. He went to the lower parts to preach. He went to the demons and preached to them, Tartarus, and he went to Hades and he preached to them, both the lost who were going to hell forever and the saved. God bless you. And I'm going to release you just like Moses and Elijah told you six months ago and have been telling you for the past six months, every day for the past six months. Woo! As soon as Jesus died, gave up the ghost, boom, he was in Abraham's bosom. Today you'll be with me in paradise. And Jesus is sitting there right next to that thief on the cross who believed. And the crowd was cheering, cheering, and Jesus quieted down and said, guys, 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 I got a friend I want you all to meet. This guy was cussing me, yelling at me, hating me, and finally his spirit was changed, his heart was changed, and he believed. And he yelled over at the other thief and said, you stupid fool, you need to get saved too. Don't you know that this is the Son of God? And he believed. And he looked over at me and said, will you remember me today when you go into your kingdom? And Jesus, best he could do and look over at him, said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And today is that day. And here he is, guys. Let's give him applause. He believed. What, what does the Bible say? Heaven freaks out every time a sinner believes. It says, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. That means God himself is rejoicing. The presence of the angels is... God. They're in his presence and he's in theirs. Don't you love him? Don't you love him, man? God is so good. Man, I love you guys. I love your commentaries. Let's go ahead and read the commentary on this one because it's good too. Lindy, now what we're doing is looking at the Bible code from five hours ago. His delight was an x-ray. Check out the commentary on here, man. Lindy, she says, it's just me screaming the importance of the ELS numbers again. And I have to laugh. I always ha 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 her because she's funny to me, man. She speaks the truth. But those numbers, like she says, but seriously, dude, check out those numbers. First, we see 722. That's what the ELS was on this particular code in the book of Joshua. At every 722 skips, God is giving us a message. Exacto mundo. It's God. What? Sean just said he's about to post another one. Praise God. All right. So first we see 722. The number seven means divine completeness. We saw that a second ago because it's always the same. You, you want to know what seven means, guys. Okay. Divine completeness and perfection. It's perfect and complete because it is God's number. It's God himself's number. Seven days of creation, seven years Shemitah. The cycle goes on and on and on all the numbers. The number 22 means light. It also means the year of rapture when you'll become light. Hello? 722. You guys know that this is the seventh month on the Jewish calendar and this is year 22 on Greg's calendar? What? Numbers are important. Learn them, know them, see what's going on around you. Hear God's signal, see his signs. He's only wanting to giggle with you and laugh with you and wink at you. When you've had a bad day and you see 722, you're like, praise God, man. You don't have to hear any kind of spiel or anything. Just 722 will remind you that this is the seventh month and God's about to rapture us in this year. And then you can go on from there. Here means the completeness and perfection. His light is the glorious moment of Jesus' resurrection. Amen. There's not a more fitting number sequence for the very code, and God chose these numbers on purpose to show us his glory. The other ELS number is 721, 723. They're also perfectly fitting as well. 21 means appointed time. He's going to rapture us, guys. Everybody can see me. Can I see you? He's going to rapture us at an exact appointed time, not willy-nilly. Uh, imminency whenever he wants to willy-nilly 
whenever the father feels like it. Okay, I think now's good. It's an appointed time on purpose. We have always known this. He's always told us that. Okay. It's an appointed time. And 23 means death. Hmm. Michael Jordan. He was a symbol, emblem of death for the bull god. Do you guys know that or what? Do you know that he was a ritual unto the Antichrist and the devil? Do you know that he made a deal with him? He's a 33rd degree Freemason. Do you guys understand all that? Chicago is the city of blowhards. It's the city of the devil. That's where Barack Obama, the Antichrist, lives. That's where he's from. And that's where the Brown Bomber played basketball number 23 for this idiot. And it was always a symbol of death. And when everybody was rooting for MJ... Hmm. M, 13th letter, J, 10th letter, 23. When everybody was rooting for MJ, they was rooting for death. Their own. Death to America. And how many rings did they get? How many crowns, coronas did they get? It's all a ritual, buddy. Do not praise men. You glorify God and flush all that other stuff. It's all idol worship, guys. If you worship Jesus and your idols, Jesus and your hobby, Jesus and your favorite TV show, you're a Baal worshiper. All the way through the Bible, you're going to worship Jesus and him alone. Or if you worship the others, you don't even know Jesus of Nazareth. You, you worship a different Jesus. Continuing on, 23 means death. Jesus' death and resurrection were both an appointed time on God's calendar. Otherwise, why would they have perfectly coincided with the three feasts, the Passover, unleavened bread, and the first fruits, unless they were ordained appointed times? Jesus died for us willingly so that we may have a hope and a promise of our future resurrection with him for eternity. These numbers also testify to the very promise along with the Bible, the shroud, and all these codes. Further down, we can see a 1444 ELS. Oh, this is getting good now. If you've been here following in this journey this year through the codes, those numbers will look very familiar to you. 444. That's Sean's number. You, you go look at his website. It's Sean.Mitchell44. 444. Okay? God gave that to him a long time ago. That's God's numbers. Which she says here, how 444 is tied to the rapture. It's also tied to the Feast of Pentecost and the middle candle of the menorah, which began at Pentecost. And the next candle that is lit will put an end to the church age, the Pentecost. That'll be the rapture candle. Hallelujah on the Feast of Tabernacles. Because when you light the candle, you take that middle candle, you light it first, and then you light one, two, three, and then you come all the way over here and seven, six, five, and you put the fourth one back. Jesus is the one who lights all the candles. And he lit us through the Holy Spirit. He said, it's important that I go away. I'll send you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came down on the Feast of Pentecost. And we've been experiencing the Feast of Pentecost every day of our lives, walking in the Spirit, walking with the Spirit, walking under the Spirit. And when people get saved, the Holy Spirit comes inside them and they experience Pentecost, the church age. And very soon, That'll come to a completion. The bride will be completed, fulfilled, and God's going to light another candle, the rapture candle, on the Feast of Tabernacles. All we got to do is go to these three Bible verses, passages that Sean showed us earlier on the Mount of Transfiguration that happened during month seven. And Jesus died six months later in month one, just like the Bible always said. So it coincides sequence uh, this sequence shows up here in the encoded record for the resurrection. Is it, is it a coincidence? Nope. Not a chance. The number four itself means heavenly door open, personal or spiritual change, the fourth day of creation, the fourth candle of the menorah, which is also the fullness of Pentecost season and the church age, and it means to hear or see a message. Plus, let's not forget the number 14 means righteousness and rapture. We saw that in the last code. God always has these numbers popping up for our encouragement. Learn them, okay? You don't have to learn them. Just look them up. I, I, I'm so forgetful, I can't remember these numbers. But boy, God's put 14 in my heart real good. He put 17 in my heart real good. That's victory. He put 19 in my heart real good. That's faith. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Faith, not me. I'm an overcomer. They that overcome to the end. Nope. 
my faith in Jesus. He's the overcomer. We put our faith in him. Amen. How is it uh, this not all proof of such powerful and wonderful design by our God himself in these codes and in the shroud? Another interesting part of this code is that it is found only in the book of Joshua. The shroud and the proof of Jesus' death and resurrection is encoded all the way back to the sixth book of the Bible of Joshua. And more specifically, this code is only found in Joshua chapter 10 to 22. But the majority is found in 17 to 20, 17 and 22. We just talked about that, man. Victory in 22, right? Hmm. Oh, hey. <laughs> I love Lenny. She always makes me laugh. Oh, wait. Hey, um, we've seen those numbers before, hadn't we? God is so awesome. 17 means victory and 22 means light. And the year we all became light, the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ in us, the year we all transfigured up on the mountaintop in the clouds before we entered into number four, the door, into the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible codes have told this story plainly all the way through. The plain text has. The whole code shows the victory of his light, Jesus' victory over death at the moment of his glorious resurrection, his pure and radiant transformation and change of form, as Sean explains above, this code gives me so much joy, me too. Praise God for encoding this for us to see here. All right, let's look at George's, man. First Timothy 6.16 tells us that God is immortal and he lives in uh, unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see. Okay, we can't look at him and live. Other translations say that God is dwelling in the light that no man can approach unto. The same God appeared to us in human form to redeem us, to buy us back. And this shroud is a testament of his death, burial, and resurrection. Scripture records transfiguration to reveal to us an iota of the glory of God that can be visualized. Through the salvation given to us by believing in faith, we are also promised to be part of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ at the rapture. That's what we were just describing. We're going to go up in 22 and we're going to see our transformation, our transfiguration. We're going to go from mortal to immortal. We're going to go from having bad days and bad memories and depression to having none of that anymore. And we're going to be absolutely peaking, tweaking, flatlining up top with the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace more than we've ever known. It's going to be awesome. Scripture records the transfiguration to reveal to us the iota of glory of God that is visualized. Through the salvation given to us by the believing in faith, we are also promised to be part of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ at the rapture. The source of all light, spiritual and corporal, is from God. Joshua 10, 26. They said 26 again. That's God's number. So we got the salvation of Yah, 10, the perfect number, which is 7 and 3 together. The Holy Spirit and God's completed number. And 26, God himself, Jehovah. I love it. Know the numbers and you can rejoice at a traffic light. Okay? You'll be praising God at a stoplight when you see the numbers, the license plates and stuff around you. Okay? Notice the proper things. And get rid of that dude wearing 23. All of them. Uh... Uh, this chapter gives us the account of the Israelites facing the five Amorite kings who attacked the city of Gibeon as they made peace treaty with Israel. The kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Lachish, Jermoth, Eglon, joined together to attack Gibeon. Joshua and Israel fought these five kings directed by God. Hmm. Praise God. And this is the day that Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still. And it didn't set and it stood still. Uh... As well, the moon to not rise for a full day till they were completely destroyed, until they had completely destroyed the enemy. More enemy was killed by hailstones of God's what? Nibiru. That sun stood still because the earth didn't rotate. It was the earth that stood still because of Nibiru above it. And then the hailstones was the debris tail doing it. We have incident after incident after incident when God showed up in judgment against the enemies. The Amorites were the enemies of God and these five kings needed dying and so did their military. God doesn't need the militaries of the world in Babylon. He'll take care of business and he's about to. He's about to kill all the boys who have the weapons. Okay? Uh... This is recorded as uh, the only day the sun did not set for 48 hours. With God, all things are easy and possible. The light of the Lord is from within and brilliant 
turning the appearance of the clothes and the face a dazzling white light. That's what we were reading about earlier. Brighter than the sun, the transfiguration appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ portrays his glory. The glory that he will share with us when we are raptured and glorified with him, we shall be like him. I cannot wait. This is going to be coming up during this feast. After six days, maybe, or maybe tomorrow. The first day is a big day. And the eighth day is a big day. The seventh day is a big day. Uh, just like an x-ray, okay? And we've got the glory of God. We're running out of time. Read George's stuff. Always read George and Lindy's stuff, Jeff's stuff. Okay, they got good stuff here. And I just blew that channel there. Okay, let's get back to Sean's page and look at this new code. We got to look at this new code, man. Bam. And so why is it my computer wants to freeze? I've been having this issue for several days now, guys. I'm excited about seeing this new code. Let's see here. Boom. All right. Let's go to Sean's page. We're looking at Sean's page. Eight minutes ago. Eight minutes. Uh, this is the one that says, what is identical to an x-ray? <laughs> okay, so the shroud itself was an x-ray, and then it x-rayed Jesus' body. You can see his bones in the thing. All right. Let's see what Sean says. He says, is there a similarity between the flash of light projected by the atomic bomb with the shroud of Turin? In addition, famously seen in World War II photographs are shadow-like images which were burned into the walls and buildings of support structures following the bomb's detonation. Man, those are pretty wild when you see them. Silhouettes of objects, animals, and humans were cast as shadows by the light of the bomb as a uh, dematerialization power of its explosive energy was released. The Shroud of Turin is a shadow-like silhouette-like image. Many scientists believe that the energy force equal to or greater than the atomic bombs dropped on Japan in World War II created the Shroud's image. As a result of that event, the body of the man resting within the burial cloth dematerialized. That's interesting. Um, the Shroud of Turin bears up on its once dazzling pure white linen fibers the glory of the Lord's presence still permanently dwelling among his people within the glorious radiant reflection of the Son of God who is embodiment of light, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. While Sean and that other guy are going to be carrying this Shroud of Turin around, preaching to people, just like Paul did in Galatians. Paul, Paul did the same thing. Paul had the Shroud in the book of Galatians preaching it. And saying, uh, his face was evidently set forth before you. Okay? So these guys are going to be doing the same thing. And it's going to be the actual image burnt, like the shadows that were burnt into the walls. This was the shadow of the Lord. The shadow of things to come. The truth. The proof of his resurrection right there before him. Uh, let's look at the code. Code by Sean Mitchell. Translation. What is identical to an x-ray from the resurrection? the embodiment of light. Yes, there was a Jewish man for Moses. Moses preaches the image on the linen. Sean's Moses. He'll be preaching the image to the Jews. Moses preaches the image on the linen. It declared the good news. Jesus was death for them. He died for them. Seek out wisdom and the reason of things. There is nothing new under the... Guys, look at this. This is the passage that is read every year along with the Torah portions every year at Tabernacles. Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Okay? Seek out wisdom. Um was the death for them. Seek out wisdom and reason of things. There is nothing new under the sun. That's Ecclesiastes. That's what we're reading right now at the Feast of Tabernacles. How timely is all this? Seal up the vision because it is for the distant future. It's powerful. It's revealed in a tree. The cross. Mm. Lift up the glory. Lift up the glory, Sean Mitchell. Moses. Lift up the glory. Hey guys, we have probably a few days left. Share the glory of God with folks. Share them. 
how to be sa saved, how to be simply saved. Sean shares this on every code. The bad news, we're all sinners. The good news, God sent Jesus to change all that. How am I saved? Read those verses. Simple, simple. God made it simple and it's easy. But most folks will choose to hate him. They hate the shroud. They're, they're going to hate the evidence. When these guys are down there in the middle of Jerusalem with the shroud over their arm, preaching the gospel, preaching Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, you're going to have people down there hating him. Obama hates the shroud. Obama hates the codes. And Obama wants these guys dead. And God's not going to let them die until it's time for them to die. And when are we told that? Hmm, halfway through the mid, uh, midway through the tribulation. Obama is going to be allowed to kill Sean and the other guy. And then when we return with Jesus, Obama's going to see Jesus and Sean and that other guy on their horses. And he is going to wet his britches. His heart will start beating 200 times a minute. He's going to be freaked out. His blood pressure will go straight up. And then Jesus will kill him and stomp a mud puddle in his head. It's going to be beautiful, man. Don't you love God's story? Don't you love his truth? I encourage you to know it. Hey, love that new code, Sean. I want to look at it. I want to look at the pictures of it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Awesome. Let's look at some of these little skippies here. 3108. Fantastic. Through Esther, Daniel, Ecclesiastes. There's an Ecclesiastes, man. All right, guys. We've gone long enough. 8, 23, 23, death. 8, new beginning. Ha <laughs> ha! I love it. This is, the, this is the battle between the new beginning life in Jesus Christ and death. 23. Choose life. I said before you today, death and life. Choose life. I said before you today, a blessing and a curse. Choose blessing. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Throw your idols out. Know they're idols. Be convicted today. Let the Holy Spirit convict you that you are loaded with idols, church. And get rid of all them. And be left only with Jesus Christ alone. Remember when the woman was brought in an adultery? Jesus said, where's the rest of them? She goes, it's just me and you, Jesus. And that's how we all need to be left in the room. It's just me and you, Jesus. Everything else is gone. There are no other gods. There are no other shinies. There are no other hobbies or anything that comes first. It's just you and me, Jesus. Amen. Hey, guys, I love you. God bless you. By God's grace, hey, we might be in heaven tomorrow. If not, we'll do a Bible study by his grace. I love you, man. Bye.